I'd like to talk to you about research that I've been involved in in some sense for about 10 years, but really seriously for about the last two and a half years. So we talk about some results uh, applying topology to understanding problems in neuroscience. So there are a number of different directions in which people in my group are working on applications of topology in neuroscience. But what I'm going to talk particularly about today is our collaboration with the Blue Brain Project. So that's even darker than I thought. So I'm going to describe first of all, I know Ron did a bit of this on Sunday, but not everybody attended Ron's lecture. And besides, there have been a, quite a few lectures in between. So I'd like to take the time to remind you a little bit about what the Blue Brain Project is, what its goals are, and what they've accomplished so far. And then talk about how topology can get involved in, uh, how topology got involved in working with people in the Blue Brain Project. So, when you talk to neuroscientists, you realize they're confronted with a really enormous problem. If you look at the sort of data that's involved in analyzing the brain, it's not just a big data problem, it's a huge data problem. When you look at the number of active genes per cell, the number of molecules per cell, the number of interactions per cell per second, you know, the number of cell types, the number of synapses, look at that, this is one brain we're talking about. And depending on whether you're talking about a mouse or a human, it's anywhere from 100 million to 100 billion cells. So if you really had to know everything about everything that was going on simultaneously in order to understand what was going on in the brain, well, it goes way beyond the capacity of any computer that we have currently available. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what information do you really need? in order to reconstruct the brain, in order to understand something about the brain's structure, the brain's function, and how its structure influences its function. So the point is that we can all be a bit lazy. You know, mathematicians always like to find the, the elegant shortcut to do something, and we're going to apply the same kind of philosophy to neuroscience now. So if you're thinking about the brain, it's not just a random object. It's very highly organized. There's quite a lot of redundancy, robustness, I mean, it can't be that your brain just stops functioning because you lose one neuron, or even because you lose a whole you know, region of your brain. It takes a lot for your brain to stop functioning, and so there's a lot of redundancy built into it. And it's really highly organized. You're, when you're born, you're ready to learn. If your brain were just completely random, you wouldn't be ready, you know, as soon as you're born, to start learning as you do. And so it's only when you have a system that is really completely random that you need to measure absolutely everything about the system in order to understand it. And so the point of what they're doing in the Blue Brain Project is to take advantage of the fact that the brain is so highly organized to just measure what's absolutely necessary to measure in order to model the brain and its function. So you have to be clever. You have to choose carefully what it is you're going to measure. And you have to measure it well. But you really don't have to know absolutely everything in order to create up with a reasonable model of the brain. So, going on two years ago now, in October of 2015, the Blue Brain Project uh, published a long article, cover article in Cell, which is one of these top journals in biology, where they described the results of the work that they've been doing for roughly the last 10 years. So the Blue Brain Project is funded by the Swiss government to the order of about 20 million per year. 20 million Swiss francs, so roughly 20, you know, a bit less than 20 million euros. And the point is to build a reconstruction, well, first of all, of part of a rat brain, and maybe, if things go so well, some part of the human brain. So this is, this is, in some sense, the Swiss contribution to the human brain project. And this was sort of the first real evidence that they were getting somewhere with this project. So I want to talk to you in some detail about what the Blue Brain model is, and what's involved in it. So what they've done thus far is to do, to do a reconstruction, a digital reconstruction of part of the brain of a 14-day-old rat, a specific species of rat. And it's part of what's called the somatosensorial cortex, which is roughly here if it were your brain, which is where your brain, the brain of the rat, starts processing sensorial information from the outside. So for example, if you flick the whisk of a rat, it's going to cause uh, some spiking in the thalamus of the rat, which then sends signals back to the somatosensorial cortex, where a decision is made about you know, where to send the signal further. Should the rat react, have a motor reaction by moving its head away? You know, how should it react to this? So that's what the somatosensorial cortex is involved with. And so they not only reconstructed the structure of this part of the brain, they also arranged so that you can actually uh, evoke 
activity in the brain by inputting some kind of stimulus, or just look at spontaneous activity. Because even when you're not really doing something, your brain is active. It's, it does spikes all over the place and so on. And so they wanted to see you know, what's going on with the activity in the brain, they wanted to model this. So a few details of the reconstruction. So what they did was there were um, five little rats, 14-day-old rats who were sacrificed. And their brains examined, this sort of a core sample in this mitosensorial cortex. And then if you go back, if I go back to this picture here, you see that there are different layers in the somatosensorial cortex. So this is going from sort of the outside to the inside. There, we say there are six different layers, although layers two and three are usually sort of identified. Usually you have input stimulus that comes in here roughly in, in layer four, gets processed there, and then is sent further. So what they did was they looked at the, in these little rats, they looked at in the different layers, the proportions of different types of cells, the densities of the cells, uh, and then this information was just input to an algorithm that would then reconstruct the, this part of the brain of the rat, taking into account, and this is really important, precise neuron morphology. It's not just roughly the shape of a neuron, but the exact geometry of a neuron, explicit connection probabilities for two neurons, taking into account these precise morphologies, and really between specific pairs of neurons. So you're not going to just say, well, I know roughly what happens. I'm going to say precisely, given these exact morphologies, what happens. And then various other biologically motivated organizing principles. So all this goes into a very complex algorithm that is run on a supercomputer in order to do this reconstruction. So what do you end up with? You end up with what we call these microcircuits. Each microcircuit, which is uh, roughly, you know, let's see, on the order of a millimeter cube of material, so it's not that big, um, has roughly 31,000 neurons, which form roughly 8 million connections. So a connection between two neurons is not formed just by you know, one axon meeting, one dendrite, that with you know, one synapse. You have a bunch of synapses from one that will come in contact with another. You need something like on the order of four or five syn synapses that connect any two neurons in order to have a reliable con connection, which is why we have roughly 8 million connections and roughly 37 million synapses. And so, why well, do we have 42 of them? Because we had five different rats, and for each rat, there was a different instantiation of the circuit that was made because the algorithm is stochastic. So you're not going to end up with exactly the same circuit each time. You're going to, there are different uh, stochastic elements that come into the construction, so you end up with a slightly different construction each time. So you did seven of these for each of the rats, plus seven average ones. So they sort of took the average data here and used that as input to the algorithm. And so now you have sort of a collection of individuals that you can examine. And then what they did, they had to do some kind of validation to show that the model that they built was some kind of reasonable approximation of reality. So there were plenty of in vivo and in vitro experiments, the results of which they could compare to in silico experiments that they did with this uh, digital microcircuit. And did the validations worked out quite nicely in many cases without tuning any parameters. I mean, you know it's still not a perfect model. They call it a draft reconstruction because they have, still haven't taken into account certain things like gap junctions and glial cells and all sorts of things like that. It's still, you know, a model, but it's a pretty good one. And something that's new is that if you want to describe this circuit, one thing you can take into account is you can look at it as just as a directed graph or something that I'll talk about in more detail soon. And the adjacency matrices for these directed graphs are now available online. If somebody wants to play with a really large directed graph, all the information is now available online if you want to use your own tools to study these graphs. So there's something called the neocortical microcircuit portal, which has all sorts of information about the reconstruction and now has these graphs available as well. Okay, so I just want to illustrate a little bit the complexity of the situation. What this slide shows here is all the different morphological types of neurons that you find in these microcircuits. There are 55 different morphological types, and you see that their morphologies, their shapes are really quite different. So here, on this side, we have the inhibitory neurons. Those are the ones who are saying, you know, when things get a little bit too, uh, you know, a little bit too active, and they say, whoo, you know, let's put on the brakes, calm down a little bit here. The excitatory neurons are the ones that always want to go out and party, and let's get things higher and higher and higher and higher. 
And the inhibitory neurons are like your parents who say, no, wait, wait. <laughs> so um, it looks like there are a lot more inhibitories. There's a greater variety of inhibitories, but they make up only 20% of the neurons in the microcircuit. 80% are these excitatory neurons, which are all, uh, you see the little, if you look at the letters, they're PC, then they're called, it's not politically correct, it's pyramidal cells. <laughs> so these are the pyramidal cells, and on the other side we have different kinds of uh, inhibitory cells. And, which, and here they're sorted by layer, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so they, they have this tremendous diversity. And one of the reasons why they wanted to do this simulation is that even over the last decades of research, there's only a handful of pairs of types for which the, in, a, in laboratory research, they've been able to determine what the connection probabilities are between the, more, the, the types of neurons, where they know a lot explicitly what goes on between different pairs. But 55 squared is a really big number, and it's going to take a, it would take a really long time if you wanted to go and determine experimentally all this connectivity data and reaction data just in the lab. So the idea was, okay, let's take what we have, let's put it in a model, and let's see how close we are to reality. And you also have to take into account electrophysiology. It's not just the shape of the neuron that's important, it's how it reacts to input current, for example. And so what we have here is one particular morphology, a layer 2-3, uh, some kind of basket cell. So it's one of these inhibitory cells. And it can have a number of different electrical behaviors. So what we're seeing there is how the neuron reacts when you input a specific current. And this is what the output looks like in each case. And you can see that there are 11 different possible electrical types. And then you look at, you can say, okay, well this particular neuron, it can have any one of six different possible electrical behaviors. So if you start taking into account the morphological complexity plus the electrical complexity, you have just an immense sort of combinatorial explosion in terms of all the different possibilities. Which is another reason why you're going to say, okay, let's, let's take what we know and let's try to build a model from there. So let me explain briefly the workflow that went into the construction of this circuit. So the first thing you want to do is to understand the anatomy, the actual placement of the different neurons in the circuit, how they're connected, all right? <coughs> so you look at the different morphological types you have, the 55 different ones, and you, don't, you know that in a, a real brain, even within one morphological type, there's going to be a lot of diversity in the actual specific shape. And so um, from laboratory work, from doing, looking at slices and doing traces of slices and so on, they have a sort of a library of a certain number of actual reconstructed neurons, but only really more for the bigger neurons. Sometimes they have only one or two that anybody has created in the whole world. And so in order to have a uh, diverse enough sample, they actually had a sort of cloning algorithm. They would take given known reconstructions of specific morphological types and create variations on that, perturbing them slightly. And then, so you take your microcircuit, and you start putting your neurons in according to the cell densities and layer heights and so on that you got from the specific rats. Then, once you know how you're, where the neurons are, then you have to figure out who's connected. So, basically, the only way that two neurons can be connected is if the axon of one comes within three microns of the dendrite of the other. But if all of those uh, potential touches actually became synapses, actually became real connections, then we have much too high density of connections. So what they had to do is there was a four-step pruning away process in order to start with you know, the potential connections and then to cut down to the actual number of connections that you got. And so in the end, you end up with uh, eight million connections instead of the tens of millions or the hundreds of millions you would have had otherwise, which would have been too many. So at that point, you've got your anatomy down. And then you need to introduce function, because you want to see what's going on with activity in this circuit. And so that's where they introduced the electrical types, the synoptic types, and then they're in a situation where you can actually simulate activity in the network. So, applications. Why? You know, I, was, I said something about why I'd love to do this. We understand, understand the function, the activity in the circuit. And so you say, okay, what sort of structure and function emerges from the different local rules that are applied in constructing this circuit. So you, you, they checked various things and you look in the cell paper, there's a long list of different uh, 
things they were able to check, properties they were able to determine based on this simulation. And in particular, for example, the effect of calcium concentration on the network dynamics. So one thing they can add to the simulation is what the calcium concentration would be in the cerebrospinal fluid. And what they noted was when the calcium concentration was low, then the neurons would be kind of firing in a random kind of way and nobody would get coordinated. It was kind of like you would be in a coma if you were, had that kind of calcium concentration. If the calcium concentration is too high, then all of the neurons are spiking simultaneously. Boom, 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 which is not very good either for any kind of functioning. You're basically epileptic in that situation. So there's a sort of sweet point between just random chaotic noise and everybody marching together, which they call the sweet spot for the calcium concentration, where there's just enough chaos and randomness that you're ready to react to whatever happens. But at the same time, there's a degree of organization, so things are not completely random. And then the circuit functions in a maximal way. So for the time being, this has strictly nothing to do with topology in any obvious way. But we said, well, this goes back to um, discussions that Ran had with Henry Markram when they were both postdocs, saying there's got to be something about topology in neuroscience. And, you know, you could say, well, you know, I'm a just because I'm a topologist, I'm going to look for topology everywhere. But, you know, it's a reasonable thing to do, as I'll explain in a moment. So what we want to do is analyze the topology microcircuit, both in terms of its structure and its function. What happens with activity? So, why topology, besides the fact that I'm a topologist? Um, well, graph theory has proved to be extremely useful in neuroscience. About 12 years ago, simultaneously, two neuroscientists, Olaf Sporns and Patrick Hagman came up with a notion of connectome to describe the sort of the underlying connections in the brain, either at the level of neurons or at the level of brain regions being connected by tracts or whatever. And once they had this sort of concept, then they realized that graph theory might be a good tool to study the brain. And it has been, has proved very useful. But, you know, topology in some sense is graph theory on steroids, so we could try, right? And also, topology is that branch of mathematics which is really ideal for studying notions of proximity and for studying local to global phenomena, as uh, Gunnar was saying yesterday. You know, topology is really there to tell you, okay, if I know things going on globally, I should be able to say something about emergent global, uh, sorry, if I know something well, locally, I should be able to say something about emergent global properties from that local behavior. So, seems like a good tool to try. So, let me talk about the topological tools that we've used. Nothing too fancy so far, and I know that for those of you who were here on Sunday, uh, Ron told you about some of this, but I think that for those who weren't there, and even perhaps for those who were, maybe it's not bad to have a little refresher. So, one thing I want to insist on is the importance of the notion of direction. So, when we're thinking about this network of neurons, we really need to think about it in a directed way, because if you're thinking about electrical connections, direct electrical connections between neurons, then information can flow either way. But those are more rare in the network. What's more common are chemical synapses where the direction of flow is it's really unidirectional. It goes from that to that right, that's it. So you really have a sense of direction from what they call a presynaptic to a postsynaptic neuron. And we want to take direction into account in a serious way. And so what we're going to do is represent this by a directed graph, or a digraph. So, consider a directed graph with a set of vertices V, a set of edges E, and a direction function tau that takes an edge to its starting vertex and its ending vertex. So this is going to be our digraph. And we can associate to this, as Ron said on Sunday, the directed side complex, which is going to be an ordered simplicial complex. I'm not going to recall the general definition of an ordered simplicial complex. For those who were done there on Sunday, it's just a variant on the notion of simplicial complex. Zero simplices are the vertices, and the n simplices for n greater than 1 are going to be lists of n plus 1 vertices, such that if I look at them in order, a v i v j for i less than j is always going to be an edge in my directed graph. And so, or it would be, perhaps it would be better to say that uh, there is an edge, so the tau of that edge is v i v j. And what does that mean? So the n simplices, in this case, correspond to what are called directed n plus 1 cliques. All to all connected subgraphs 
where there is really a sense of direction in the sun graph. So different ways of characterizing these directed n plus one clicks are to say they're the clicks that are acyclic, there are no cycles, or that every subclick emits exactly one source and one sink. The idea here, the motivation for thinking about these directed clicks, is that they are sort of higher dimensional versions of edges. If you have a directed edge, there's no ambiguity about where you're starting and where you're ending. If you start with one of these directed clicks, similarly, you know where you're starting, you know where you're ending, and there's always, there's no ambiguity about what direction you need to be going in at any point. Okay? And since we're interested, when we're analyzing this network of neurons, in the flow of information through the network, we'd like to have something, some way of <coughs> characterizing geometrically which, math, uh, sort of which connections, which sets of connections actually have an unambiguous sense of direction. So here are just a few examples. So if we have here three directed graphs and the corresponding flight complexes, I'll do this one, for example, in detail. So here we have a directed graph with four vertices. And in this case, if we look at one, two, and four, this forms a directed clique because we have just a list, one, two, four, one is less than two, two is less than four, and one is less than four. So that forms a directed three clique. In other words, it's going to give us a two simplex, and so we'll fill this in with a two simplex. On the other hand, if we look at two, four, three, this is now a cycle. We don't have a source or a sink. And therefore, that set of three edges is not going to give us a two simplex. So this is where it's different from thinking about undirected graphs and their ordinary flight complexes. Okay, we see a big difference here. Another example here, if we look at one, three, four, on the one hand, if we look at this upper arrow here, then this set one, four, three is again a directed click, and therefore is going to give rise to a two simplex. But if we take the lower edge in this reciprocal connection, now we have a cycle again. And that's not going to give us a two-simplex. And one reason for mentioning this example to you is that reciprocal connections can and do often exist in networks of neurons. So it's important to see that this is the sort of thing that we're allowed to talk about. And it's easier to talk about in this um, directed context than in the undirected. <coughs> so one thing that's interesting about <coughs> these directed clicks, and this is just sort of a, a mathematical uh, observation that, you know, sort of uh, confirms our idea that these directed cliques are the cliques that have a sort of a maximal notion of direction, we can define a notion of directionality for a digraph. So we can look over the sum over all the vertices of this, the sum of the squares of the in degree, so how many edges are going into V, minus how many edges are going out of V. And so, and take the sum of the squares of this, it's some sort of norm that we're putting on this set of directed graphs. And somehow picks up how, mu how much of a sense of direction you have in your graph. And we see this proposition that confirms this, that the directionality of a directed, oh, this should be n and n, oh well, of a directed n-click is maximal among all digraphs where this should be n vertices and no reciprocal connections. So you really are maximizing, in some sense, a really good measure of how you go. And if we look at what's happening just with five clicks, for example, so here we're looking at all the possible ways you can orient a five click. And you compute the, the directionality in each case, you can see it can be anywhere from zero up to 40. And this maximal directionality happens precisely when what you have is actually a directed five click. So that was just sort of some more formal way of saying, of expressing the, the importance and properties of these directed clicks. Okay, so now, now comes the big moment. We're going to take these topological tools and use them to analyze these microcircuits. Okay? So what does the analysis of structure involve? Again, uh, Rand told you something about this on Sunday. For some of you it's a reminder, for others it's a new story. So we have these 42 reconstructed microcircuits, seven for each rat, each of the five rats, and seven average ones. And so we're going to look at the directed five complexes associated to those or to the underlying directed graphs. And then we wanted to do some comparisons with various null models. So the sort of the silliest null model is to compare this to erdos renyi graphs, so a directed version of erdos renyi graphs, and with the same number of vertices, and with a connection probability of 0.8%, which is the, the average connection probability in the microcircuit. 
And then a more sophisticated null model was to say, okay, we had this very um, sophisticated way of determining uh, how, more, how neurons are going to be connected, taking into account the precise morphologies and the exact connection probabilities between specific neurons. Now we're going to say, okay, we're just going to think about specific morphological types. We're going to take average connection probabilities, which are distance dependent, but okay, they're sort of average connection probabilities. And we're just going to use those average connection probabilities instead of insisting on looking at specific morphologies. And so otherwise we're not changing the positions of the neurons or anything, just changing how we connect them in a way that would seem reasonable if you said, well, you know, why does it really matter the exact shape of the neuron? And then we did another randomization, also starting with the same positions of the neurons in space, with something that's called Peter's rule, which was a, a rule invented by a neuroscientist who said, they figured that this was kind of the way that neurons connected. He said that if you have a pair of neurons such that the axon of one comes within three microns of the other, then, as I said, there's a chance that you can form a synapse there. And instead of going through this uh, complicated four-step pruning away procedure that, that was used for reconstructing the blue-brain microcircuit, we're just going to apply some sort of uniform probability to pair away, to prune away connections until we have the right number of connections. So just sort of using something purely mathematical with no real biological meaning. And so we're going to compare those. And I think Ron already showed you this graph. But what this shows you is the distribution of simplices for these different cases. So this blue line on top is the distribution of numbers of simplices for what we call the bio-M circuit, so the average biological circuit. And you see that it has, first of all, a lot more simplices. Notice that this is 10 to the 7th here. We're talking about 80 million two simplices, 75 million two simplices, for example. And not only does it have more, but it has simplices of higher dimension, up through dimension 7 here. So if we compare this, for example, with Erdős Renyi, Erdős Renyi has, yeah, it has 15 million two simplices, but then it completely dies out. There's basically nothing left after dimension three, or even nothing at all. And if you look at the other two, where for this one, all we did was say, okay, instead of looking at specific morphologies, we're looking at morphological types, then we have many fewer simplices, and the top dimension is five and not seven. So this is some indication that adding in these precise morphologies and using those to determine connectivity makes the structure much, much more complex. Many more simplices, many higher dimensional simplices. And when we're thinking about these higher dimensional simplices, keep in mind as well that it's not just saying we have, for example, in the case of a seven simplex, eight neurons that are all connected. They're all connected in a precise way. There's a total order on the vertices which has to be respected. So this is fairly highly structured. So that's, that, was just, that was our first indication that yes, very good, they've spent 200 million Swiss francs and ended up with a circuit that at least is not random. <laughs> so as a Swiss taxpayer, I am very happy about that. Now, um, once you notice that there were so many of these simplices in the network, I said, well, let's go back into the lab and see whether you can find such simplices in actual brain slices from rats. So at DPFL there's somebody named Rodrigo Perrin who is maybe world champion at something that's called patch clamping, where you take glass electrodes and insert them, you know, micro electrodes, and insert them very, very carefully into the cell bodies of neurons. And they do, he does this up to 12 neurons simultaneously. And then you feed a current into one of them and see which other ones react when you do that. It's a way of trying to determine which of these neurons are actually connected to each other. So Rodrigo did a bunch of experiments for us where he took these patch clamps, of, he did 55 different patch clamp experiments with up to 12 neurons at a time and looked for these sorts of simplices and found two, three, and even four simplices. So that's amazing out of just 12 neurons to be able to find that. And so once he'd done that, uh, one of the people working in Blue Brain said, okay, now I'm going to do an in silico version of that experiment. Of course, the advantage is it goes a lot faster. You can do 100,000 instead of 55. And these experiments have to be done when the laboratory is body temperature, 36 degrees. You don't have to suffer quite as much to do these. And so he ran the experiments and saw that indeed, if you do 
simulated patch camp experiments, you see sort of a, a similar kind of distribution of simplicities. Just sort of picking out 12 neurons kind of randomly in the network and saying, okay, are they connected? So that was, that was nice. You see, you see these kind of structures actually in real life as well. I wanted to give you a few details of, this, of the distribution of the simplicities because people often ask, well, you know, how, to how many simplicities does a neuron belong and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to show you a few uh, examples here. So if we look at this here, A1, if you look at the dotted line, so that was the, the curve that was in blue previously, showing the distribution of simplicities. And when we're looking at this red curve here, we're just looking at the excitatory neurons. So we're forgetting all the inhibitory ones. You know, we're just going to have a wild party without any parents. And you see that actually, you know, this makes it look as if a good fraction of the simplicities are actually formed primarily or exclusively from excitatory neurons. If you compare that to A2 here, so this is just looking at the inhibitory neurons, simplicities that are formed purely by inhibitory neurons, and you see that we're looking at three orders of magnitude smaller, 10 to the 4th rather than 10 to the 7th, and that it dies out pretty fast. So the inhibitories among themselves don't form that many simplicities. And remember, they make up only 20% of the neurons altogether, so not too surprising. But also, they're just, you know, they, they don't form units that are quite as large. Here we were doing a comparison of the different layers, layer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And we see, for example, that a very large fraction of the simplices are actually formed in layer 6. Not surprising, it's a very dense layer, a lot of very big neurons, but they're sort of, it's like um, we're saying that really big pieces of the structure are built from the neurons at the very bottom of the, of the column. And we have many fewer in the higher layers. Here, if we look at B, what we have on the y-axis is how many neurons. And then on the x-axis is how many three-dimensional simplices you have per neuron. And you can see that if you go out here, you can have up to 50,000 three simplices to which one neuron belongs. Most of them will belong to fewer than 10,000, agreed. But you can have on the order of 50,000 three simplices to which one single neuron belongs. These are really complex interwoven structures we're talking about. Um, another one with D here, there's another simplices per neuron. So if we look, for example, the top curve here is layer 5. So in layer 5, for example, you can have up to 12,000 two simplices per neuron, up to 16,000, 15,000 three simplices per neuron on average, and so on. So you can have the huge numbers of simplices per neuron. So this is really just to give you some idea of how incredibly complicated these structures are, that simplices can share lots of neurons, and neurons can belong to very, very large numbers of simplices. Okay, that was about function. I'm sorry, that was not about function. <laughs> that was about structure. But what we're really interested in, or at least I'm really interested in, is how the brain works. Not you know, sort of what it looks like, put it in a box and admire it. You want to actually see it work. And so you want to know something about, you'd like to be able to say something about how structure influences function and things like that. So since you've been saying that these simplices have somehow, they seem to be structurally important, they're distinguishing the microcircuit from random circuits and so on, you'd hope that they played some kind of functional role. And so this is the first indication that they do. So what we're looking at in this graph is the following thing. We're measuring the dimension of the maximal simplex, so a simplex that's not a face of any other simplex, for a given connection. So we take a connection and we say, okay, so we have a one neuron that's connected to another from presynaptic to postsynaptic, and we're saying, okay, what is the largest dimension of a simplex to which this connection belongs? And that's what we're measuring here. And what we're measuring on the y-axis is called the mean, is the correlation between these, this, in the spiking behavior, the electrical behavior of these two neurons. The dotted black line here is the average correlation for any connected pair of neurons in the entire microcircuit, so about 0.3. And what these different curves are measuring are the correlations in an edge based on the dimension of the maximal simplex. And if we focus on the red curve, for example, so there we're looking at two neurons that are the ultimate and penultimate neurons in a directed simplex. So the sync and the pre-sync, if you will. And so these two neurons are connected. And you see that as the dimension of the maximal simplex to which they belong increases, their correlation increases as well. 
So that's a first indication that the size of this simplex to which you belong has an effect on the electrical behavior. On the other hand, if we look here, what's going on with what I wrote, 2 and 1? Okay, when I say the dimension of the maximal simplex to which a connection belongs is 1, that means that connection is an edge that lives all by itself. It's not part of any higher dimensional simplex. And if you're not part of a higher dimensional simplex, then you're really pretty isolated. And your correlation, even though you're connected, your correlation is still going to be very low. So it's not enough to be connected to have a high degree of correlation. You have to be not connected and part of a bigger picture in order for, to have correlated activity. So even when you're thinking about some, you know, an edge that belongs to a two simplex, there you're just, you know, you're kind of average, you're nothing special. And it's only when you start belonging to higher dimensional simplices that you get higher degrees of correlation. And if you, so for the curves with, of other colors, here it'd be saying, okay, for the blue, you can be a connection any place in the simplex. Green is from source to the next one, and red, whatever the color that is, is from source to sink. And you see that really the best is when you're at the very sort of end of the simplex, because then you have the most common information coming into you. Then you get the highest degree of correlation. So this was our first serious indication that structure did have a link to function here. Sort of in a more sophisticated point of view, we can also look at this question of dimension of a simplex to which a connection belongs and the degree of correlation. So what these different graphs are showing us is along the x-axis in each case, it's the number of maximal simplices per connection. And again, on the y-axis, it's the correlation of this connection. And if I look, for example, at 3D here, so I'm looking at how many maximal three simplices, to how many maximal three simplices does the connection belong, and you see that the correlation increases with the number of simplices to which it belongs. Same for four simplices, five simplices, and six simplices. And not only that, the number of such simplices to which a connection has to belong to attain a certain level of correlation, let's say 0.45, is much smaller for the larger simplices. So to attain something like 0.45 degree of correlation for 3D, I have to come out to being part of something like 120 different three simplices. Whereas to reach the same level with four simplices, it's only about 50. And this with for 5D simplices, it's only about 10. So the higher the dimension of the simplex, the smaller the number of simplices to which you have to belong to increase your correlation. So it's another indication that the dimension of simplex plays an important role in, like, in correlating the spiking behavior of the neurons. And also, so here this is, again, these 1 and 2 Ds are showing that it's because they have a negative slope, that you really have to have, you know, being part of only a maximum one or maximal two simplex isn't enough to attain a good degree of correlation. Only when you belong to really maybe a lot of two simplexes. Okay, so let's analyze activity. So is this going to work? Right, so. Here we have a little video of activity in the circuit. So we can see the electrical activity moving through it and so on. And it's a very pretty picture, at least I think it's a pretty picture. Um, probably very expensive to produce for some point. <laughs> and just, uh, just showing this activity spreading. And what I'd like to point out is that um, even if you know, so you can see this pretty picture, you say, well, what, what's going on? Is there any way we can analyze this behavior? Because it's very, you know, it seems sort of chaotic and not easy to understand really what's going on. So our idea is that if we look at this problem through the filter of algebraic topology, we should be able to discern some kind of structure going on there. Because if we just look at it like the picture of the movie that I just showed you, it's not, uh, it's not clear at all what you can say about it besides the fact that it's pretty. So how does this, the topology of the microscope circuit shape its electrical activity? That's the question we're going to try to answer now. Oh, now it wants to do it again. Okay. okay, so what we're going to do is a kind of coding of activity in the circuit. So when neuroscientists talk about coding, they usually talk about things like rate coding, at what, uh, at what rate is our neurons firing. So you take a specific length of time, you see how many times does the neuron fire in that day. And you look at this for all your neurons, and this should be some sort of code for what's going on in the brain. 
They also talk about time coding, which has to do with, it's important to see when neurons are spiking relative to each other and things like that. What we're going to do is a kind of coding for activity in terms of digraphs. So for the network, for the microcircuit, we have this underlying digraph. We have this structural digraph that tells us which neurons are connected to each other. And starting with that digraph, we're going to encode activity as a time series of subgraphs of that digraph. So a sophisticated mathematical kind of coding. So what we're going to do is, uh, if we look at um, activity over a certain length of time, a second or so, define it, in, define it usually into five or ten millisecond time bins, and then sort of take snapshots of the activity and try to figure out which connections in the network were active in that particular time bin. And that will give us a particular subgraph that we're going to look at. We'll always have the same set of vertices. And we'll just keep those edges which were actually active, where there was a presynaptic neuron that's fired and causing a postsynaptic neuron to fire. And the way we determine that is by what we call the tr transmission response rule. Because you can never be really sure that because this guy fired, this guy fired. Because this one usually has something like at least a thousand different neurons feeding into it. And telling which one really caused it to fire, that's, you know, you can't really be sure. So we came up with some sort of statistical rule to determine when we can consider that, yeah, this guy probably caused this guy to fire. And what we decided in the end was to work as follows. So we, define our, we divide our time up into these time bins, uh, five milliseconds. And within the nth time bin, we'll say that we keep, there's a connection between neuron J and neuron K, if there's at least a structural connection. So I have to start with the sort of a ground truth of the structural connection. And if neuron J fired within that time bin, and then neuron K fired at most 10 milliseconds after that, then, you know, by a different statistical analysis that we did, that there's a good chance that it really was J that caused K to fire. And so that's going to give you a subgraph of your directed graph. You keep all the vertices and you keep only those connections that satisfy this rule here. And one thing I wanted to point out is that if you do this, you make the following observation, which is another indication that simplicities are somehow important in the microcircuit. So what we did here is do a comparison. This was just with some sort of spontaneous activity, recording spontaneous activity over a certain time. And looking at uh, the different transmission response graphs that we got, so doing this binning process and looking at the time series of subgraphs. And so here, what we were doing is, for example, in dimension four, looking at how many four simplices there were in the flag complex associated to the different subgraphs that we were getting, as a, fra in, as a function of the number of edges that were actually active in the graph. And we get a sort of a curve that's given by these blue triangles here. The comparison to make is with these orangish triangles here. So what, was, what, what did we do here? We said, okay, we start with a structural graph and randomly take edges away until we end up with the same fraction of edges that we had got ended up with in this transmission <coughs> response. And what you see is, if you take edges away randomly, then the number of four simplices that you get dies away extremely fast to almost nothing. Whereas in the actual graph, the, the, so the actual microcircuit, the proportion of four simplices you get is much, much higher than what you would get if you just taken the edges away randomly. So somehow, in this activity, your, the, 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 the microcircuit is working in order to maintain these high dimensional structures. They, they must, so maintaining this higher degree of organization. So it's really a highly non-random process. And then if you just look at the blue squares and the red diamonds, it's the same thing for dimension five. So here it dies off much faster in both cases, but at least we see that we have a lot more of these in the uh, transmission response graph. So lesson here is that these transmission response graphs, again, have a tendency to keep these higher dimensional, more organized structures. Okay, so then we did an experiment that, I, that Ron alluded to on Sunday as well. We wanted to do an experiment to try not just spontaneous activity, but evoked activity, and compare the responses to different sorts of input stimuli. So there were nine different input stimuli that we used. So here we're looking at this as if we were looking at the microcircuit from above, 
and we're seeing which regions of the microcircuit are being stimulated and how. So the, the input signals that were used were actually recordings of actual thalamic output after a rat had had its whiskers flicked. So really a sort of real biological input, which was then sort of structured in different ways. And there were different sort of degrees of synchronicity. And then we input this sort of a level four of the, of the uh, microcircuit and saw how the microcircuit reacted. And so, as an example of the sort of thing we were measuring, we'd say, okay, suppose we have a particular four simplex. So here's one with the source, and then there's vertex number one, vertex number two, vertex number three, vertex number four, building a four simplex here, starting with a layer two, three pyramidal cell, a layer four pyramidal cell, another layer four pyramidal cell, and then two layer five thickly tufted pyramidal cells. So you have this nice uh, simplex here that's sort of spread out over the whole microcircuit. And then what we do is do what's called a raster plot. So you see how many times the neurons are firing. So here we did 30 different trials of one of these stimuli. So that's what this 0 to 30 is. And then you see which neurons are spiking and when. So each little black dot here is a spike of the neuron, of neuron 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And you see this sort of these different spiking patterns of the different neurons. And you see in particular, for example, neurons 3 and 4 seem to be pretty highly correlated. And also that they kind of that they start spiking after zero, one, and two. So you sort of see this flow of information in the directed simplex. So that's the kind of thing we were measuring, except we did this simultaneously for all of the neurons. As you did this. Or we didn't, and the computer did, right? Okay. So what did the experiment give us? Well, what we did was, since we have a time series of these directed graphs. We can then look at the time series of associated directed flight complexes and then the time series of the associated topological invariants. Here it's the number of one simplices, the number of the Betty 1, Betty 3, and the Euler characteristic. And so here on this axis you have time, and then on this on the y-axis you have the different invariants. And you see that they you know they all have to sort of spike at the beginning when the signal comes in and then they react. So we had sort of three different classes of input signals, the red, blue, and green which were, had different degrees of synchronicity. And so the ones that were more, more synchronous, they had sort of the strongest response and so on. But so when we, when uh, about two years ago, we first did some computations of, for example, the Euler characteristic in these cases. And I thought it was just so cool that, you know, you input the signal and the Euler characteristic spikes. It's like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> why, should, why should this topological variance spike sort of the way a, a neuron does? But all of these, all of these uh, invariants sort of do this. And you can say, well, you can sort of see some differences, and hmm, how are we going to analyze this? Well, there's a much, um, a very illustrative way to illustrate this behavior. We're going to compare Betty 1 to Betty 3 and see what happens. So we're going to plot Betty 1 against Betty 3. Ah, oh, I've been waiting six months to show this figure in public, so we really enjoy this moment. <laughs> it was embargoed for six months. Okay, so let me explain what this picture is. We're looking at three different stimuli. Okay, so it's the same pattern with different degrees of synchronicity. And what we have here is we're plotting Betty 1 along this axis and Betty 3 along this axis. And this is sort of the way time is going. Here we have, so the, the things are sort of very quiet for a little while after the initial stimulus and then around 65 to 70 milliseconds, you see the number of homology classes of dimension 1 that starts increasing, increasing, increasing up to uh, 140,000 and then all of a sudden, that number starts decreasing, but at the same time, the number of three classes is increasing. Until all of a sudden, whoosh, it all collapses. So this is what our friend Henry Markham liked to call the sandcastle. <laughs> Building up a, you know, a structure that has sort of these one-dimensional pieces, and then is not plotted here because it'd be a three-dimensional plot. You have the two-dimensional pieces that come in, then the three-dimensional pieces, and you get this beautiful construction, and then whoosh, it just collapses. And that's the, to us, that is sort of an illustration of the information processing. We have inputting the signal, the brain is processing this information, it somehow comes to a decision, it reaches the end of its processing process, and then boom, it stops. And you see that with the three different stimuli, so this is sort of the strongest, middle, and the weakest, they all have the same basic shape, sort of different amplitudes and so on, but they're all kind of center in the same way somehow. So you have this, this sort of similar shape each time with the one-dimensional classes that are coming, then the two, and then like this. And so this is, it's interesting, this is sort of a signature 
of the information processing in the circuit, in this sense. So that's with various stimuli. We could also see, oops, back. We could also try the same stimulus, but with a different rat. So we have five different rats, bio one, two, three, four, five. And we can say, okay, how do they react to the same stimulus? And you see that in every case, there's again this pattern of Betty one that increases, then Betty three, and then collapse. And it happens every time. It's just that, you know, they're sort of shifted from each other, or they have different amplitudes, or something like that. So it's just a, a pretty sort of stereotypical pattern of reaction, of information processing, that we're capturing by looking at this activity through the filter of algebraic topology. And then to get some idea of where the activity actually is in the microcircuit as this is going on, we plot it. So this is the circuit here with its layers from 1 to 6. And it's a heat map showing where there's the most activity, red being the most and blue being least. And you can see the activity is sort of input here in level 4 or 5, like that. And then as the number of one simplices, uh, sorry, um, as Betty 1 increases, you see there's more activity spreading there. And then you start building up these Betty 3 as the activity starts moving down into these deeper layers where you had many more high dimensional simplices. You have a lot more highly intricate structure there. And then it collapses. So what this is saying is that the, the brain, as it's processing information, it sort of develops these more and more highly organized structures. And then when it reaches the end of the processing, it just goes back into a quiescent state. Okay. So some open questions and further applications, because I've just had time to talk about sort of one of our projects in neuroscience. What we're going to be thinking about, and one of the things we're going to be thinking about next is the effect of plasticity. So plasticity is a strengthening and weakening of connections between neurons, or even the creation and uh, elimination of connections between neurons. And for the time being, we're going to be thinking about what happens as connections simply become stronger and weaker. And to do that, you're going to be thinking about not just a simple digraph, but a weighted digraph. So you have to give them weights to the edges, just sort of the strength of the connection. And they're doing some very... Uh, very involved experiments on a supercomputer at Argonne National Labs right now to uh, test these effects of plasticity, how, how the, uh, the microcircuit changes the weights on the edges as it is learning things, as it's you know, being exposed to repeated stimuli and so on. And so in that case, we're actually going to start using persistent homology because we'll have a weighted digraph. And that's basically going to say we'll have a weighted version of the vittorius ricks complex with which we'll be working. So we'll need to do some pretty powerful uh, persistent homology computations. And my dream is to use more sophisticated topological invariants than Betty numbers. Um, I have a deep intuition that structures like the, com the cup product and perhaps even the steam node algebra will have interesting things to say. We'll have will encode important information about the microcircuit. But that is uh, even further down the road. But I think, yeah, maybe in a few years we'll have some interesting results along those lines. And something I didn't have time to talk about today, but I think is very interesting, we've also been working on using something more like, well, really is persistent homology in order to analyze neuron morphologies. Because one thing we want to do for uh, later drafts of the microcircuit is to use, have a wider variety and a better selection of different precise neuron morphologies to use. And for that, you need to synthesize a lot of artificial neurons. And the one way to synthesize them is to understand really what the structure of the neurons is. So together with a PhD student named Lita Canari, we've developed uh, uh, something we call a topological morphology descriptor, which is a way of associating a persistence diagram to a specific neuron, which turns out to be very good for classifying neurons even better than human experts, which is very good. And, oops. And now, the idea, Lita is actually using this in the opposite direction to say, okay, now I know what the barcodes, the persistence diagrams are supposed to look for for these classes of neurons, and I'm going to use that to feed it back in and synthesize new artificial neurons. And the synthesis process is going so well that she's even been able to fool experts into believing that her artificial neurons were actually real neurons. <laughs> so, yay topology. <laughs> Okay, with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Paweł Glapko, Ran Levy, my postdocs in Lausanne, the people from the Blue Brain Project, and Rodrigo Perrin, who did the heroic uh, 
catch climate experiments. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I don't know if you've seen these graphs that uh, Professor Marodia and Matt Kayla produced way back when, where uh, Betty, Betty 0, Betty 1, Betty 2, Betty 3 sort of taking turns in random complexes. So, oh, that's, that, it's not at all the behavior in this circuit. It's very, very different from a random circuit in that sense. Yeah. And if you, so Matt worked out his, those results about where you can expect the, the peaks in homology for undirected graphs. But if you take his formulas, basically, they shouldn't be too different for directed graphs, then you know, the peak that we get, we actually computed uh, some things for homology as well, but they also looked at the numbers of syntheses, and the peaks you get for the artist renyi complex are what you would have expected from Matt's work. And uh, this is just showing that this is really very, very different. Yeah. And how does P2? Yeah. Betty 2, so it, it also, I mean, it has, a, it has a sort of intermediate behavior. So we could have thought of Betty 1 versus Betty 2 there. We would also see Betty 1 increasing and then Betty 2 increasing. So, you know, we should really create some sort of spiral graph with, in three dimensions, with Betty 1, 2, and 3. And you would see that they, they take turns like this. Please. Um, have you been asked by neuroscientists <coughs> what the better numbers would mean biologically? So uh, so, I mean, people, people will ask this, and I think that uh, on Saturday, I didn't want to, uh, Sunday rather, Ron showed a graph that uh, shows that if we look at these different rats, okay, we did the crazy thing of plotting, uh, in that case, their homological dimension is 5. We're just looking at structure, okay? And if you plot Betty 5 versus Euler characteristic, you have the separation, pretty nice separation, of the different individual rats. And there's one of them in particular that has a really high Betty 5 and low other characteristic or the opposite, and you think, hmm, I wonder if that one was smarter than the others. Unfortunately, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, one, one could wonder, because I would think, perhaps, that, you know, if you have, think about how hard it is to create a five-dimensional homology class. Just the degree of coordination you have to have, and this is it's easier if you're thinking about things undirected, but if you're thinking about directed simplices, building a five class is combinatorially complicated. So having a number of five dimensional classes means you have a, quite a complex structure in your brain. And I suspect that probably, you know, having a larger high Betty numbers may be associated to, oh, it's certainly associated to a higher degree of complexity of the structure in your brain, and perhaps also to something having to do with intelligence. But we're a long way from being able to say anything like that for real. Yeah? So I noticed that in the, the graph of the patch clamp experiments, and the simulated patch clamp experiments, it looked like the real patch clamp experiments had more three and four simplices. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that's an indication that the model is, that still has some way to go? Absolutely. That's exactly the way we interpret it. Because we suspect that as the model becomes biologically more realistic, um, including a better variety of morphologies of neurons, including you know, more of the pieces that go into the brain and so on, that we will see a more and more complex structure. We think that what we've determined so far is a lower bound on the complexity. I'm impressed by the level of connectivity in the brain, of course. Is it possible to say if the brain is, in some sense, a directed expander graph? Is it possible to estimate the level of connectivity? Um, I've thought vaguely about that, and I don't know the answer to the question. And I think, because I'm, I'm not familiar at all with expander graphs, but it is a natural question to ask. And if somebody would be interested in attacking that problem, as I said, the graphs are now available online. So if somebody who has the tools wants to go check that out, that would be fantastic. Why is, it, why is it blue? Um, IBM. Ah. <laughs> IBM provides the computers. I see. Yes. <laughs> IBM makes computers specifically for this project. And they are blue. They are, well, they're called blue gene. <laughs> Other questions, comments? <laughs>
Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.